All right, we'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, first, let's just make sure that everyone can hear me. So if you can hear me, type in the chat box. Just to make sure that the audio is working. Perfect. So you guys can hear me. Um, oh, perfect. Awesome. Okay, thank you so much. So throughout this webinar, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the question box or into the chat box and we'll address them at the end. My name is Sabrina Wazda, and I am a marketing specialist here at Alliance Benefit Group Rocky Mountain. Today we'll be welcoming Christopher Barlow. Chris is the Managing Director of Know How 401k, which is our 401k sales champion program. And if you would like a free subscription uh, to this program, you can contact us. So Fran Mulgrew is the one who will help you with this, and her email address is fran.abgrm.com, and I'll type that into the chat box as well. Chris is a coach and consultant who assists financial advisors to grow and improve their 401k businesses. And without further delay, I'm going to hand the time over to you, Chris. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sabrina. And uh, thank you also for uh, taking time out of your day to be with us. Uh, I appreciate Alliance Benefit Group Rocky Mountain for giving me this opportunity to uh, speak with you. Uh, Fran Mulgrew, as Sabrina introduced, as well as Sean Orham. So a couple weeks ago, we talked about building a business plan and um, being as effective as possible in accomplishing your long-term goals uh, as a result of building uh, 401k into your book of business. Today, we're going to talk about bringing your business plan alive with uh, prospecting and profiling and working towards accomplishing your goals out there. So in our first uh, webcast, we talked about steps one and two, preparation and planning. Today, we'll be talking about steps three and four of the seven step 401k sales champion process, prospecting and profiling. And as Sabrina mentioned, you can get access uh, to my full workshop, which contains uh, all the information I'll be speaking uh, with you today, plus much more. So I hope that you all do get access to the workshop and uh, take your time to go through and, and review it. Uh, and uh, hopefully get great benefit out of it as well. Uh, you know, we've all are in sales. Uh, length of time is really the only thing that differentiates us. Uh, selling is, is very similar, uh, no matter what the uh, service or uh, good is. Um, when you take a look at uh, reasons why salespeople succeed, I really believe it comes down to uh, these three keys to uh, prospecting success. Uh, defining their expectations, uh, they're choosy as to which prospects they pursue, and they don't give up. They stick to it. Uh, defining your expectations, this was one of the exercises associated with uh, building your business plan. Uh, defining the expectations is critical uh, because the number one reason why advisors start and stop uh, pursuing 401k plans is bad expectations. They think things should just happen at a much faster rate uh, than what uh, they actually might be happening. So defining your expectations uh, is all about looking at your goals, uh, looking at the um, target description of a prospect, uh, and starting to break things down, reverse engineering, by looking at um, uh, how long, how, what's your activity on any given day, week, uh, year out there. So if your goal is 25 million in 401k assets over five years, and that's the time period I typically work with advisors on, and they define then their description of a target that their average plan is going to be two and a half million, uh, then they need 10 plans over five years, two plans a year. There's 240 total working days in a year, and that's simply the uh, math of 20 days a month times 12 months. So over five years, uh, that's five times 240 or 1,200 total working days to make your dreams come true. 
And I'm a fan of the 10% rule that if you need 10 plans, I believe you need 100, 100 cold prospects out there. And in your plan, you define what your prospect stage definitions were so that uh, you, you could uh, keep your emotions in check. You define that only 40% of your cold prospects over a five-year period of time will invite you to come on site and conduct uh, with them the discovery meeting. After that's over with, they're known as warm. You're going to publish a proposal for 50% of these people. And as a result of publishing the proposal, conducting that uh, uh, sales presentation, uh, you've got hot prospects of which you're going to present to 50% uh, of them. So when you start to break things down, 1,200 days, 100 cold prospects with daily activity cycling through your 100 cold prospects a month, uh, every two weeks or so, you'll engage in a conversation. 40% uh, of your 100 uh, or 40 will warm up. 40 into 1,200 is 30, so basically every 30 business days, you're conducting a discovery meeting. Half of those you publish a proposal for, so that's 20, divided again into the 1,200 days, that's 60. So on average, you're publishing a proposal, conducting a follow-up sales presentation every 60th business day, that's every quarter, one a quarter, and then you close 50% of your hot prospects. There's your uh, 10 closed plans divided into the 1,200 days, closing a plan on average every six months. So that's two per year for five years to give you your 10. And now what you're able to do is to just write out statements of what makes a great day, week, month, quarter, and year. So that when you're building your plan, you can say, well, my expectations any given year, I'm going to cycle through my database 12 times of 100 cold prospects. I'll have 24 initial conversations. I'll conduct uh, discovery meetings and publish six proposals, follow up sales presentations, close two plans. That's clarity to set those correct expectations. Uh, start and stay choosy. Uh, you can't serve every plan you can pursue. You know that? Shoot, decision makers can't uh, speak to every salesperson that calls them either. You know, start and stay choosy. Uh, it's always about whether or not you want to do business with them. This could be a long-term relationship you're hoping to have with the prospects. So uh, do that work, you know, uh, be diligent on the front end with your research and, and selecting them as part of your cold database. And then as you go through your profiling questions, you know, make sure it's a good fit for you long-term. Um, screening prospects based on qualitative characteristics you know, the paternalistic management, you won't know about that until you're on the inside, maybe until you've witnessed it or you've spoken to employees or centers of influence, you trust their opinion of what goes on at that company. Steady growing employment, the engine of your business is plant participants. How many plant participants uh, do you have? Proximity, of course, it's much nicer to uh, do the 6 a.m. enrollment meeting when they're 20 miles away as opposed to 200. And then what about community activity? Um, whether it's uh, not-for-profit type of work, uh, but also I, I had a prospect uh, that became a client and the thing that attracted me not only was, you know, the size of the plan and number of folks and all that good kind of stuff, but it was because they had to be the number one advertiser on television. And I knew if I got them, I'd have name recognition. So these types of, you know, qualitative characteristics, look at your prospects, from that perspective too. And all the online research you can do from the various database uh, uh, providers out there provide to you the quantitative uh, side of the equation, the screens that you work with. Uh, when they fill out form 5500, uh, they're using a lot of numbers, not a whole lot of words to explain things. Uh, so that when you are asking your profiling questions, make sure you ask questions to pull out qualitative. Uh, uh, screens as well. But building a database really needs to begin from uh, leveraging into relationships that you've worked so hard uh, to already put in place and, and asking them, you know, who do they know? Certainly individual clients, whatever it happens to be, you can alter this sample note here. But just jotting off a note, mailing it, nice professional approach, let them know that you do serve. The number one reason why 
uh, when asked, uh, clients of advisors, why don't you have your 401k with your advisor? They tell you they didn't know. The advisor did 401k as well. So making sure your current client base realizes that 401k is a part of your overall business. And then inventory. Who do you know? Clients, neighbors who are business owners, uh, employee clients, uh, influencers, CPAs, attorneys, TPAs, HR consultants. You know, the list goes on. Who do you know uh, that either can supplement the number of leads that you have in your database or help you to verify and connect with those leads in your database out there? Um, over the years, I, I was uh, introduced to this uh, certain degree of logic about the quality and benefit of relationships. It's called the prospect quality score, and this can help you to determine uh, timeliness, and probability of uh, turning a prospect into a client. And there's two factors to the prospect quality score, the relationship factor and the plan change factor. And each of the factors have this rolling scale of uh, 0.25 to 1.0, uh, de depending upon the uh, uh, degree, the quality of the relationship, the highest score, sound relationship, the lowest score, cold solicitation, plan change factor, they're officially searching. They can't stand their current provider advisor till uh, 0.25, not considering a move at all. So you want to focus on those prospects that have a PQS of 1.25 or higher. Those are the higher probability sales that can close sooner. But the, because of the power of a sound relationship, they could not be considering a move, but because of your ability to communicate value and, and um, uh, much greater effectiveness on their behalf, they can be motivated to move as well. Uh, you've heard these statistics, uh, Pareto principle, whatever it happens to be, the 80-20 rule. Uh, but from a sales perspective, uh, the national sales executives kept track over the years where 20% of sales are made on the uh, first through the fourth contact, 80% on the fifth uh, to uh, on, uh, to the 12th, uh, so to speak. So it's all about staying in touch, being persistent over a long period of time. I call it polite pestering. I think um, uh, monthly stalking, you know, professional stalking. Uh, I'm here to tell you decision makers wish their salespeople reached out to prospects consistently month in and month out. It's an asset uh, that you draw upon as you develop your raw prospects into solid clients, um, your goal is to uh, be in touch with them or at least attempt to uh, speak with them at a much higher frequency than any of your competition. And uh, hopefully the current advisor is speaking to a monthly, but I think uh, uh, you know as well as I do, that's not always the case. One of the greatest compliments I was ever paid was by an owner of a company wonderful plan wonderful company we won the right to serve their plan and he called me up to tell me the good news and he said uh, you won etc cetera, etc cetera. he goes you know i just got to tell you <clears throat> from start to finish you've been the most persistent salesperson i have ever dealt with uh, and i want to ask you will you come and talk to my sales team about what it took for you to win this plan and of course, I took advantage of that, and it was a great experience out there. But to me, persistence is totally under your control. It's a, it's a common characteristic of people that succeed. Um, and it's this force that you can draw upon, as I was mentioning earlier, that you can help overcome those hurdles when you think things just aren't happening fast enough. Persist. Uh, there's a, a great author, O.G. Mandino, I hope. You all recognize his name in this book. And a wonderful quote uh, about uh, uh, you don't quit until you succeed uh, is what it comes down to. I know that uh, Sabrina is going to give you all a, a link to this webcast. So uh, when you get that uh, and click through, you can slow down and take a look at this quote if you're not already familiar with it. Uh, but also strategic partnering. You may be in an office. Uh, where there are advisors that have great relationships with business owners, but they have no desire whatsoever to serve the 401k plan. Well, that's your opportunity to strengthen the overall relationship the advisor has 
by keeping in house, if you will, the 401k plan as well. And you'll see some examples of strategic partnership agreements uh, within the e-toolbox, within the workshop, I'll uh, introduce to you if you're not already familiar with here momentarily. Uh, but uh, make sure anything that's going to be uh, an agreement between two internals or shared with the uh, public, make sure your compliance uh, department uh, sees that as well. Otherwise, once you've uh, exhausted all of the connections you might have from existing relationships, order up a database. Uh, you don't need to buy a database. Most uh, record keepers uh, and other uh, wholesalers can provide to you a database. Uh, just give them the parameters you defined in your description of a target in your business plan and uh, tell them what you're looking for, the number out there, and be more than happy to get it to you. Uh, in the e-toolbox too, you'll find some uh, direct mail email messaging there to inspire you, you know, kind of take it and craft it to your own style. But uh, when you think about your marketing activities and getting the good word out about who you are and getting a consistent positive message about services you deliver, uh, you know, a consistent drip campaign, whatever it happens to be, here's some suggested ideas. But quite honestly, the best place, I believe, is what I call from the horse's mouth. That's uh, the Department of Labor. The Employee Benefits Security Administration, EBSA, has free publications. You can download a PDF or you can order for free, uh, no cost shipping, uh, brochures. Uh, so however you want to do it, uh, this is, like I said, horse's mouth. These are the folks that uh, are responsible for uh, uh, managing, monitoring the laws Congress passes concerning qualified plans. So uh, I think that they add that a bit of credibility that can distinguish you too from other advisors out there might just be handing out or mailing out some program providers material, if you know what I mean. And the honest truth, and we all know this, uh, is that they don't read what we send to them. At least that should be our belief. The vast majority don't. What we hope for is that they see our name, our firm name, uh, as it goes from uh, them picking it up to tossing it in uh, the waste can, you know, be, because what's most important about direct mail is the follow-up call. If you're not going to do a, a follow-up call for every direct mail piece you send out, Unless the prospect has told you in, in no uncertain terms that you don't need to call every month, uh, every, every mailer should be followed up. It's a second touch. It's, it's, a, it's a touch that most of your competition don't want to do, quite honestly. So again, distinguish yourself out there. Great advisor I've worked with over the years out of Maine uh, was on his sixth time through his database. And uh, he highlighted these 10 companies that have not taken his phone call yet, but were just ideal plans. So he developed a strategy he called aggressive forechecking. And you hockey fans know aggressive forechecking is getting in the face of your opponent and uh, making yourself known to them. So what he did was he put together this campaign uh, based on materials from the Employee Benefit Security Administration uh, to be sent out and received by these decision makers at these 10 companies. Uh, so the first was a, uh, a letter on Monday to be received on Monday, just introducing himself saying over the next several days, you'll be receiving information to better manage your plan. Tuesday, Wednesday, they get brochures, those Employee Benefit Security Administration brochures out there. And um, uh, then for Thursday delivery, he mailed out a nice note again with a gift card and and said, you know, I've I've sent you some great information, uh, and I hope you find it useful. But you may need a cup of coffee to stay a week. Uh, that following Monday, he called the ten. He got through to six. Uh, I hope that's your experience if you undertake this type of activity. Uh, but what it does show you is being unique uh, in the mind's eye of the decision maker can enhance the probability that they're going to take your call. I do like workshops. I think they're great marketing activities. Uh, I think a lot of advisors get focused on how many um, people actually show up. Uh, I, I remember that uh, in the workshop flow, uh, you have this multi-touch, the invitation, the follow-up call, 
confirming their attendance the day before, and even if they didn't attend, follow up after them, you know? Uh, and of course, the most efficient use of your time in doing workshops is pre-assembled groups, whether it's a rotary or a, a SHRM meeting, whatever it happens to be. And if you're doing uh, your own workshop, bringing in outside speakers, having them bring their clients, whatever it happens to be. Uh, when I was in personal production, I worked at Merrill Lynch, and uh, they had a 90% penetration rate in the market I was uh, prospecting into. So I knew if I had any chance of um, success, I needed to get out of the metropolitan area I was in and go to a satellite town. And I chose the town where my father was from uh, for uh, good reasons, uh, in addition to the name recognition. But what I did was I went around town. I introduced myself to well-known businesses like the McDonald's franchise, right? And the plumber and the electricians and the grocery store owner and those types of folks. Just talking to them, getting to know them, letting them know who I was, what I did. I got on the radio. I had two radio stations uh, that I would do stock market reports. I taught at the adult school. Uh, you know, financial planning, those types of things. My largest customers in my retail business came from that approach. And I really felt a lot of them wanted a, somebody out of town to manage their money. It was, uh, the town was a little bit too, uh, uh, too close, if you will. But uh, making sure you're telling your story to the right people is critical. And making sure that you understand who that person is. Uh, you can always start with the person that signed the 5500 if they are an employee of the company. They're not always. Uh, but uh, your odds of acquiring, accomplishing your goals are better uh, when you do speak to the people that can actually impact your success. Uh, the first cycle through, and I said that on intently, the first cycle through is your opportunity to clean your database up, go to the company website, make sure you got right decision makers, spelling their name correctly, right street mail address, getting their email, whatever it happens to be, those types of things. And cleaning up your database with your CRM. And every time you do this act, whether it's verifying data or adding new data, it's like making a deposit into a uh, savings account. Your database gets more and more valuable every day. And your time gets more and more expensive every time, every day. So that's why I strongly encourage do it on the first cycle through your database uh, and um, uh, know that uh, it's just a matter of addition going from there. But it's never been easier to get research on your plans. Um, it's one of the wonderful characteristics of going after the 401k business is the quantitative side of plans is public information. And uh, you can really use that and, uh, to your, to your uh, great benefit. But uh, otherwise, you've got Google and LinkedIn and things like that. And although it's a much better uh, turnaround these days than what it used to be, data is still going to be old, no matter what you have. So verification of the data, public data out there is very important. Uh, in the workshop that uh, you all can get access to, there's a tool called the profiling menu. And the profiling menu takes you through the entire prospecting and uh, profiling flow. Uh, it begins with a conversation you may have with a receptionist uh, who you may think was hired expressly to uh, keep you away from decision makers, but ask for their help. You know, just verify, you know, is this the person I should be speaking with? What's the best way to communicate with them? What's the best time of day, so to speak? And it's not only building your business, getting assets under management, but prospecting promotes your brand out there and you're in control of it. It's uh, building your reputation, which will become a much larger part of how you win business uh, in the years to come, your reputation out there. So I believe it's like exercise for an individual, although I'm not ever going to try to convince you that I do this uh, exercise, physically exercise. But I absolutely believe prospecting is something I personally still do every day. Uh, it's there to enhance the health of my business, uh, keeping the uh, prospect funnel uh, going. But uh, there are uh, teams out there 
where the senior person will have a junior person be prospect facing. Uh, there are advisors that buy leads. Um, I could uh, go on uh, for a half hour about that if you like, but I really think that when you take a look and you break it down as the amount of time, I really think that owners and every advisor uh, is an owner of their business. And I think that that type of passion and, and uh, voice inflection comes through when you're talking to them. I'm here to tell you owners like talking to owners. And as you uh, continue on in your career year after year after year after year, your experience is a differentiator in the marketplace out there. And, and it's interesting I can remember the first days of reaching out to cold prospects beginning my retail uh, advisor career <clears throat> and just wishing, wishing I had more experience, wishing, you know, that people would take me seriously, wishing that people would recognize me. And I talked to advisors that have been in the business, you know, 10 years, 20 years, that stop this cold calling. And they just don't think it's worth their time. And I, and I remind them of what they were wishing about when they were first starting out. And now they have all of that and think how much more effective they can be now on the phone out there. And uh, it's a human um, condition, call reluctance. Uh, we don't wanna put ourselves out there and be, you know, knocked down. Uh, we don't like call, uh, uh, you know, to have objections or whatever it happens to be, anything negative. Why would we put ourselves out there for someone to make a negative comment about us? But it's what you gotta get over. One of the benefits of building that plan is you define reverse engineered what you need to be doing every day in order to eat the elephant, you know? And then as you're monitoring, you can see uh, the progress you're making as you enter your activity into your activity worksheets. I'll talk to you here about momentarily. You can visualize and see the amount of dials you're making, conversations you've had, appointments you're setting. It keeps you in the game. And remember, if you're able to talk to them more about more than just their 401k plan, whether it's institutional financial services or individual financial services, you can pivot. If the 401k is going nowhere, and it's, it's gonna go nowhere for 90% of your cold prospects out there. But this initial contact, it doesn't matter if you're cold calling, dropping by, or that first conversation you have with a referral, you're gonna have that initial contact. And it's all about building rapport, right? It's all about helping them to, uh, helping to develop that trust bridge, if you will, that they trust you know what you're doing and uh, trust that you're different than others uh, out there. And they do this uh, very quickly, decision makers. It's easier for them to do in person uh, than over the phone, but they'll still feel it out. Uh, and remember, uh, they get a lot of phone calls every year. They get pl plenty of practice as to what they don't like out there. Always remember though, that it's still your need to be choosy uh, to get down to that 10% that you're gonna do business with as soon as possible. And I've said this and I, I continue to say this, but persistence is not only an asset, but it's a, it's a, it's a feature, if you will, that decision makers can understand about you. Um, as you continue month in and month out, making those calls or dropping by or somehow getting introduced uh, by a referral, uh, that uh, I had one advisor tell me, uh, he finally got through to decision maker after several attempts, several months. Decision maker, had the advisor launched into his opener, decision maker said, whoa, 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 I know who you are. I know who you are. You get, I get a piece of mail from you every month and a follow-up call. I know who you are. And the advisor thinking real quick on his seat said, we'll get used to it. When you become a client, I'll be calling you monthly as well. Back to that uh, profiling menu. I said it, it contains all of the prospecting profiling th uh, flow. Well, you've got openers, voicemail messages, profiling questions, and statements to overcome objections. Uh, be very curious when you open that up and take a look at it. Openers to me are, are critical pieces of communication because it's all about that trust building up front. You're doing it over the phone. Uh, they wanna hear crisp, clean, 
uh, not run on? What is it? Why you? You know, what is this? Why are you different than everyone else I hang up on? Those types of things. So once you get the opener done, then you move into questioning and an opening question and then uh, initial profiling questions. We'll talk more about those in a moment. But this was my favorite opener is because it not only resonated with me, but it led to the most opportunities out there. And think about those worst calls you've ever gotten uh, from solicitors out there. Well, those are characteristics you never want to emulate. Um, and remember the decision makers getting bombarded. So be different, right? Be humble. I know you weren't expecting my call. I'll be brief. And I was fortunate to say, you know, over several decades, I've been helping employers like you managing their company plan. I'm hopeful for the opportunity to speak with you about how I go about my work. Is there a chance we might have that conversation? Uh, general services, uh, if you don't want to just go 401k specific, but you want to keep it more macro, uh, use a general services opener, letting them know that you can help address any personal or institutional financial need. But once you deliver that opener, then you again ask one opening question, and then you're going to go silent. Just one question uh, that hopefully primes the pump for them to begin talking. And if you're dealing with dentists, doctors, physical therapy offices, you know that low probability the doctor, dentist, PT is going to pick up, but you're going to get a, an office manager, a business manager. So treat them just like the decision maker. Uh, although not 100% of the time they're going to be the decision maker, 100% of the time they're influential in the decision. So not only process them as you would any other decision maker, but early on ask them about the relationship. Because you know as well as I do, doctors, dentists, and other small professionals uh, have relationships. And you need to clarify that, see whether or not it's uh, still a good use of your time to pursue them, right? You're trying to get down to the 10%. Uh, practice managers, though, uh, have groups just like uh, uh, human resources like SHRM. So check it out, uh, mgma.com, uh, Medical Group Management Association. Uh, there's Legal Group Management Association, those types of things out there. They have uh, local chapters just like SHRM if you're looking to uh, leverage in to an influential group. Profiling questions, uh, uh, there, there's two types. There's the few initial, and then there's the many discovery. And for the vast majority of them, they're open-ended. You know, the who, what, where, when, why. And uh, written like that so that they can tell you much more than what you're actually asking for. Uh, and these open-ended questions can get them talking. Um, I, I mentioned it uh, briefly where it's so easy to get quantitative information about your prospects. <clears throat> what lacks is qualitative. So think about your profiling, your initial profiling, your discovery meeting profiling questions as ways for you not only to verify what you already know, quantitative about their plan, but get that qualitative side uh, to their plan as well. You know, why did you start the plan? Uh, what problems? You know, this, these are answers that you can't find answers to in any database provider out there. So that's the purpose of these. And also to uh, make sure that you want to continue to pursue them right? That you want to continue to work towards them being one of the 10% out there. Uh, question nine, again, is the relationship question. Um, you, you need to ask this. You can compete against anyone. I believe that. You should all know the levelness of the playing field that you're playing on, so to speak. And by the way, this question is one of those uh, tips to how courageous you are. A lot of advisors don't want to ask this question because uh, they just don't want to upend things going on. Uh, like you, I'll get lots of phone calls throughout the day, uh, phone numbers I don't recognize, right? And they don't leave a voicemail. And so I knew my decision was correct and not picking up. Um, it would have been a waste of time. It was a solicitor, et cetera, et cetera. So where we really badmouth robocalls, they really are giving us a benefit. 
if you're a professional and go about cold calling because if you leave a voicemail, they're going to recognize your phone number next time you come, they come through, you come through. And hopefully you're leaving a, a message uh, that resonates with them as well. But it's about you being in control of the first impression. You didn't have the live conversation, so do it in the recorded version. Uh, it's much more memorable to a decision maker as opposed to your name and phone number on a piece of paper, pink paper. And again, it's a demonstration of persistence. Remember what I said earlier about I get a phone call from you every month? Well, that was the reason why he was able to say that. And LinkedIn, just a moment on LinkedIn. And I know there's some great information out there about social media, of which I listen a lot to. I'm nowhere near expert. LinkedIn, though, I think is really important that you define who your audience is going to be. Number two, LinkedIn is not Facebook. Uh, LinkedIn is that professional approach out there. So let decision makers know that you want to invite them to join your group of other local employers and other professionals that serve local employers uh, sharing best practices, that type of thing. Uh, objections, uh, as soon as you make that dial and they pick up, man, you should be uh, expecting incoming. You know, objections coming at you. So uh, they're just obstacles. You just process them. Uh, you know, the other thing about objections is uh, decision makers have um, been conditioned to know that if they throw one or two out there, you're gone, right? Uh, you know, I've got a whole in the profiling menu, I've got two pages of my favorite objections that I've uh, heard over 30 years. And I tell advisors that are newer to 401k, decision makers haven't had to think of any new ones. The old ones work just fine for them. So, you know, it's about processing and, you know, relaxing and acknowledging and probing with another question if necessary and coming back with confirmation you know, that your solution can overcome that. Whatever it happens to be, it's, you know, just be a professional as it comes. They're not attacking you. They're not objecting you. They're objecting to your call, the timing of your call. They're objecting to you being one of the hundreds that, you know, uh, advisors that want the same thing. That's what they're objecting to. So just manage it. See where it gets you. Uh, you don't have to check in each month. We talked about that earlier, um, you know, but a different twist. That you come across information all the time. You're a student of the game. And you share information with your plan sponsor clients uh, in the hope that they'll implement, think about in order to improve their plan. You just want to share it with prospects as well. But when you think the time is right and, and uh, you believe it's, it's okay for you to spend more time with them, uh, set up the discovery meeting. You're going to leave your office. I know you can do go-to meeting and other things like that, and they're, they're awesome. But um, we're going to talk momentarily about why you want to do it in person. So you're going to set this up. You're going to leave your office. There's a cost for you to leave your office. Uh, so you got to make sure it's well worth your time again, getting through those nine initial profiling questions. But uh, you'll see a, a close for the discovery meeting within the profiling meeting uh, menu as well. And just keep your database, you know, uh, pruned. Add new information. Update information to uh, when it's verified, those types of things. Uh, keep uh, information on all conversations, goals the employer may have for the plan. And make sure you're monitoring your activities. Like I was talking about earlier, one of the best ways of overcoming call reluctance uh, and any other sort of hesitation about moving your business forward is reflecting on past progress uh, that you memorialized within your uh, spreadsheets out there. In the workshop, I have two of them for you. One's called the Daily Acquisition Activity Tracker, DAT. It's a typical tick sheet. And the other is a roll-up of the DAT uh, for the weekly acquisition activity tracker. Take a look at that and uh, be more than happy to answer any questions you might have uh, 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 at the time. But one advice from an advisor, and I hear this uh, consistently, is uh, just stay in the game, stay motivated. This is about building your business. Appreciate the interaction you can have with these companies. These are heroes in your community uh, for the most part out there, right? Uh, they had to be in business maybe 10 years before they were convinced they could actually stay in business and offer a health plan 
401k wasn't even the first benefit program. So learn from them. Talk, ask them about their history. Hurdles they had to overcome. You'll not only endear them, uh, endear yourself to them, but it'll, it'll really help you to get that perspective uh, to stay to it. Look, look what they did. Uh, they stuck to it as well. It's a small piece of any day. You know, it's five minutes a call. If you're dropping by, you got travel time. Uh, if you're doing uh, uh, referral calls, you know, whatever it happens to be. But uh, just make sure that uh, you stay in the game and, uh, you know, whatever it takes for you to get it going. But, you know, once you have these qualified prospects, if you will, that they've gone through your initial profiling and now you're going to take the time to leave your office and do what I call the discovery meeting. This is the second most important step of the seven steps. Building your business plan. Planning is, is step two, and that's number one, not to confuse you. Step four, profiling, is number two. And every one of us that's listening has gone on sales presentations. And we, we think about why we weren't chosen. And personally, when I think about why I wasn't chosen, it's usually one of two reasons. Number one, we were proposal fodder. The decision was made who was going to get the plan before I ever showed up. And number two reason why I wasn't always chosen is I didn't know what I needed to know in order to win. I did a poor job of profiling. So that's why profiling is number two uh, in importance. Uh, this discovery meeting is not only the opportunity for you to, to continue to ask questions to understand the company, the employees, uh, and to enhance the probability of being chosen, uh, but it's, it's, it's much more. So first impression, again, you had your over-the-phone first impression. Now you have the physical first impression. It's a way for you to show your value add. You can bring materials with you uh, that can demonstrate how you go about your work. Ask these open-ended, tough questions, soliciting quality responses, right? You want to come out of this discovery meeting with more, better information than any of your competitors out there. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to uh, continue the process of this profiling. And, and in so doing, I created a presentation. And you'll find it within the e-toolbox in step four. It's a positioning presentation. Very simple, 10 slide. It talked about why we do what we do, how we go about doing what we do. And the last slide, there was 10 of them. The last slide were logos of all the client companies. And uh, I kept that up. And the header was of that slide, employees of these companies are our clients. And I kept it up because I wanted them to recognize their neighbors, uh, their golf buddy, uh, people that go to the same church or grocery store, whatever it happens to be. I wanted a connection to be made, and I wanted to leverage into it. But then I'd go about my presentation, and when I was over with, I'd launch into my 50 or so discovery meeting questions. And again, these questions, you can find them in the e-toolbox, uh, the discovery meeting questionnaire. I want you to work with uh, Fran and Sean and Sabrina. Show them the questions that you want to use initial and discovery meeting and uh, get their opinion as well as ask them, are you missing any? Are there other questions that you should be asking as well? I want you to take your time and go into the e-toolbox e and look at those questions uh, and not spend time uh, with you on this webcast today. As you begin to close the discovery meeting though, you've got this great inventory of information. Uh, you're gonna want to get uh, the facts on their fees. So you're asking for the plan level 408B2. Uh, there are other tools uh, that you can ask for to kind of benchmark. Uh, the comparative chart of investment alternatives is a requirement. It's not often recognized by decision makers out there. 408B2 is becoming much uh, their default when it comes to fee disclosure. Ask for a copy of the summary plan description, maybe just the enrollment kit that contains the summary plan description. Ask them for a tour of the facility if it's pr appropriate. Um, and if, again, appropriate, maybe you're um, 
being able to converse with plan participants, you know, about their impressions of the plan and those types of things and, and ask that decision maker to uh, consider accepting your invitation, your LinkedIn invitation out there. There's so much you can accomplish beyond answers to your questions. That's why I encourage the physical discovery meeting out there. So after the discovery meeting, they've moved. They've, they've gone from a cold, a gradient of cold to warm. You know, these are, that's that 40% of your database uh, that you uh, are, again, screening out and getting to a position where you're going to be uh, publishing a proposal, conducting a follow-up sales presentation. We'll talk about that in our next webcast. Uh, but I do want to bring up a specific topic about, you know, when you're inside a plan and asking questions to keep in mind what we call broker of record, where it's not always necessary to change the plan, but you can just change out the advisor. And that's what broker of records all about. There's no faster way of, of getting assets under management. There's no blackout, there's no conversion, nothing, no communications. Oh, well, I might wanna have a welcome letter from the CEO announcing you're now involved with the plan. But one of the top advisors I've worked with uh, was very busy doing lots of broker of record and he shared with me how he goes about explaining, you know, that you don't have to change your plan I know it's disruptive for your company, but your employees still need help and you need help. So what we can do is simply change out. We become the new advisor to your plan. And when we're inside, we're immediately going to get in front of your employees and enhance their confidence, <clears throat> excuse me, about the plan and how to use it to achieve their goals. And then we're going to look at the cost structure. And if we're able to, we're going to recommend lowering expenses. But as we're on the inside, month in, month out, working with your plan participants, if we believe a new program is in your best interest, we're going to recommend that. And, and because of the rapport we have built up, we're going to have a much smoother conversion uh, with the plan participants with the new program out there. Just some points to um, uh, wrap up here. Spend your time with folks that can actually impact your success, decision makers. Um, have discussions with all decision makers. Make sure you clear the deck. Uh, these are decision makers. They're used to being asked tough questions day in and day out. They respect that. Give them plenty of time to talk. Uh, share with you everything you need to know in order to win. And promise only what you have control over. And that's your service, which we're going to talk about in the uh, next webcast presentation. I do want to encourage you all, if you haven't done so already, send a message to uh, Sabrina or, or Fran or Sean and get access uh, to the workshop. Nine hours of video contact, 30 e-tools, the profiling menu, the PAM worksheet that I talked about. Um, and again, any next steps you have, feel free to reach out to uh, Fran, ABG, Rocky Mountain, or myself. But Sabrina, what I'd like to do is just pause to see if we uh, have any questions from attendees at this time. Perfect. Yeah, I don't see anyone right now. Um, but if you guys do have questions, feel free to type them in. Feel free also to reach out to me, either dial me direct or uh, send me an email too with your question direct too. But Sabrina, I'll turn it back over to you for uh, closing comments. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris, for taking the time to present for us today. Um, and thank you also to everyone who's taken the time to join us. You know, you've got crazy busy schedules, but I hope that you learned something to help with your sales process today. So we have one last webinar on November 14th in this three-part series. And if you haven't registered yet, then the information will be on our LinkedIn page, and it should also be in your email inbox. I'll shoot out an email after this uh, webinar. Um, and that's the end of our presentation today. So thank you so much, and hope to see you next time.